So today I'm going to talk about the different types of interactions that particles can undergo. And following on from the last video I made, I'm going to talk about the bosons that are involved as the exchange particles or force carriers in those interactions. So as I said, many of the bosons that we know about are actually the exchange particles for the different types of interaction. There are some bosons that are not exchange particles, so not all bosons are exchange particles, but quite a few of them are. And as I said, an exchange particle is like a force carrier. It's our way of representing the force acting between two things. So there are four types of interactions that you need to know about. Now this first one, the gravitational, this is much more in the A2 specification, so I'm not going to talk about this too much because you just need to know that it is one of the four, and then you go into it in more detail in A2. The second is the electromagnetic, sometimes called the electrostatic. Again, this is covered much more in A2, so I'm not going into too much detail about it. Basically, this occurs between any charged particles that are happening, but I'll talk about it a little bit more. You've got the strong nuclear force, which acts between nucleons, or thing in, things inside the nucleus, or in fact anything made of quarks. And you've got the weak nuclear force, which all particles can undergo it in different scenarios, some decay through weak, some just interact through weak, and again I'll talk about that in a second. So those are the four interactions that you need to know about for the AS course. So although this is covered in A2, I just want to go into it in a little bit of detail so you just know a bit about gravitational potential. So it occurs between any particles with mass, and at the end of this video I'll actually talk a little bit about where mass comes from and the Higgs boson stuff, because obviously you might have read about that. Key things to know about gravitational, it has infinite range. This means that a particle or even an electron on one side of the universe still has interaction with one on the other side of the universe. Its range is infinite, however small. And gravitational is actually the weakest of all the forces, which comes a bit of a shock to us as humans, because obviously that's it's the most dominant force that acts on us, but it's actually the weakest of all the forces. Now, a key thing to know about it is you can't be shielded from gravity. So we can feel the effects of the gravity from the sun, for instance, even if on the other side of the earth, you can't be shielded from it. So I'm just gonna talk about, do a quick sketch. So I'm gonna put on the y-axis the force, and I'm gonna put on the x-axis the distance away. And I'm gonna do this as the distance away from the center of an object, for instance, okay. So the gravity has what's called an inverse square relationship. So what you find is, as the distance increases, the force is gonna decrease, but as the distance doubles, the force is quartered. That's what we call an inverse square relationship, because doubling the distance quarters the force. So it looks a little something like that, but the graph ever never actually reaches the x-axis. It sort of just asymptotes towards it which is why you get this infinite range occurring. So that's gravitational, so let's have a move on to that. Electromagnetic. Now, this only occurs between charged particles, so say, for instance, you've got protons or electrons or your muons, your towers, that sort of thing. They're all charged, so they can interact through the electromagnetic. But both of the particles need to be charged, so a proton can't interact with a neutron through electromagnetic because only one of them is charged. It only occurs between two charged particles. So again, just like gravitational, it has infinite range. And um, the thing to know about electromagnetic is it's stronger than the gravitational and weak forces, but it's weaker than the strong nuclear force. And this is comparing them all at the same range. Here. And the key thing to know about electromagnetic is, unlike gravitational, you can actually be shielded from electromagnetic by objects. So if you go to the other side of a big planet, for instance, you can be shielded from electromagnetic from other places. So if we do a sketch again, again, same things on the axis, and it's again another inverse square ratio. Um, you can actually, there's an equation that describes this called uh, the Coulomb's law of the force and charges, which is covered in A2. But just to give you a thing you can go and look at, again, inverse square relationship, doubling distance, quarters the force, just the same as before. And obviously, my bad, should have put in units there. That is not a great graph before, but there we go. So, same shape, and there's a few key differences there. 
Okay, so we've got the strong nuclear force, so this is something you may well not have heard of. So the strong nuclear force occurs between particles made of quarks, so things like protons, neutrons, mesons, and that sort of thing. Anything made of quarks can interact through the strong nuclear force with another object that is also made of quarks. Key thing, this is not an infinite range force, it has a maximum. So let's mark that on our graph here at the bottom. So we're going to say it's maximum, and I'm just going to put it as 4 femtometers to start with. So again we've got our distance, and I'm going to do it in femtometers. Just so you know, an fm is a 10 to the minus 15 meter. Okay, so you've got f and 15 is the easy way to remember it. So we're talking tiny, tiny scales of this. And if you want to compare it to, the size of an atom is about 10 to the minus 10. So we're talking about tiny, tiny distances here. Okay, so let's again put our force on the y-axis. So the strong nuclear force can only occur outside the radius of an object. So if we're doing distance from the center on here, we need to draw a dotted line here. Okay, so that's the radius of the object. So what you find is uh, up to about 0 0.5 femtometers, you have a the force being positive up here. And for um, on, on this graph here, this is if it's above the x-axis, it's a repulsive force. So below 0.5 femtometers, that looks like an N, let's put an N, the strong force is repulsive. And this is the reason the nucleus doesn't collapse on itself, because obviously if it was an attractive force, that's this, and all of them will be pulled in close together until they eventually will pull into a tiny, tiny spot. But because it's repulsive below 0.5 femtometers, that keeps a spacing between the, the different protons and neutrons in the nucleus. So let's continue the graph. So after this 0.5, it, it actually become, goes into this section here before it goes like this. So this section here is attractive. So this is what binds together the nucleus. This is why the protons and neutrons don't go shooting off in all different directions, because you'd think, well, surely the protons, they're both positively charged, so through the electromagnetic, they're going to repel each other. But no, the strong force is the strongest of all the forces. So as soon as they're in this range between 0.5 and 4 femtometers, the strong force will take over and bind together the nucleus. Which is why the nucleus is such a, such a small part of the atom. It's a t they always say oh, it's like a golf ball in a football stadium. So that's why, because of this strong force, that's why they're bound so tightly together. And as you can see, the strong force can be both attractive and repulsive. And it's the same, the electromagnetic, which I looked at earlier, can also be attractive or repulsive because same charges repel, different charges attract. Whereas the gravitational force can only ever be attractive. We don't actually have a way of sort of repelling other masses. Although when they start to think, uh, if you want to go out and do some more reading on this and look at dark energy and dark matter, they actually start to think maybe, well, maybe there is a way you can have masses repelling each other but the course doesn't go anywhere near that sort of information. So as far as you're concerned, the gravitational is attractive. Okay, so let's move on to look at the final one I've seen before. I'm going to look at the weak force, and I had to make a slight correction here because uh, PowerPoint doesn't like doing superscripts and all that sort of stuff. So the weak force has a maximum range of 10 to minus 17, so I'm not even going to bother to draw a graph from this because its range is so tiny, you just say it has the same across that tiny, tiny distance between zero and that number. And the weak is actually responsible for quite a few things. So first thing to note is the weakest of all the forces apart from gravity. You'd think having the name like weak, it would be the weakest, but it's not because it's slightly stronger than gravity, but it's weaker than the strong and electromagnetic forces. Okay, And in, it can occur between particles, all kinds of particles, in, but in different ways. So hadrons, which I'll come on to discuss in a future video, these are, these are all made of quarks, so they don't interact through the weak interaction, they actually decay through the weak interaction, I'll explain what that means in a second. Whereas leptons interact through the weak, so they actually have an interaction between two leptons is the, the weak force. 
But when I say that hadrons can decay through the weak, what I'm saying is the weak interaction can cause one quark to change into another quark. So, uh, for instance, as you'll come across in some of the types of decay, an up quark and down quark, you can change between those two with the weak interaction. So in, say, for instance, uh, beta plus decay, you get a, I mean, let me get this right, so you get a proton turning into a neutron, so you get an up quark turning into a down quark, whereas in beta minus you get a neutron turning into a proton, so a down quark changes into an up quark. So you can only go between the certain type, and I looked at this when I looked at quarks, because strange and charm are interchangeable, although obviously you don't need to know about charm in this course, and top and bottom are interchangeable through the weak interaction. So those are the possible changes that you can make in a, an interaction situation. So like I said, we linking back to the stuff I've done on bosons, when we talk about these types of interaction, we say there's an exchange, a particle also being exchanged when two objects interact. And to demonstrate this, we have what's called an exchange particle, and that is a, it will be a type of boson. So I started with gravity, I probably shouldn't have because it's the most complicated. We don't actually know what the exchange particle is, we haven't ever been able to detect it. But the proposed name for it is what is called a graviton. You'll notice with a lot of bosons, they end in this T-O-N or O-N sort of ending, so you can easily identify them as bosons. But like I said, this one is just proposed. We don't actually know about it yet, because gravity is, because it's so weak, it's really hard to know too much about it. Whereas the electromagnetic, we know much more about it, and we say the exchange per particle for this is what we call a virtual photon. And um, so when you're showing two particles inter interacting through the electromagnetic, you show them exchanging this virtual photon. And the key things to know about photons are they have infinite range, so that's why the electromagnetic has infinite range. They are also massless, they have, and they're chargeless as well, so some of the key properties about them. In the strong nuclear force, we have an exchange of what's called a gluon. Again, it ends in the O-N, that shows you it's a boson. And this does have mass associated with it, so it's not a massless particle. And the weak, which is the one that comes up most frequently, you, there are actually three exchange particles. Um, two of them have a W to indicate that they're the weak exchange particles, but then there's also, nice and confusingly, a Z boson as well. So, as you can see from this, um, the, w the W plus boson is positively charged, the W minus boson is negatively charged, and the Z boson is actually neutrally charged. Again, these have mass, so they don't have zero mass. And... Uh, a key thing that I've seen you need to come up is, if they ask you what the exchange particle for the weak interaction is, you cannot say W boson. You need to say either W plus or W minus. There is no thing called a W boson. It's either W plus or W minus. I thought that might be useful to draw to your attention. So just to address something that's not relevant to the course whatsoever, but just might be of interest, um, certainly over the last few years, there's been a lot of talk about something called the Higgs boson. And since I was looking at bosons and interactions, I thought I'd quickly touch on it and give you a bit of guidance about how you go finding out more about it. Basically, the proposed idea in the standard model is we haven't actually yet got a reason that things have mass. Nothing we've found so far would ever give anything mass. That it doesn't, it can't explain why we have in it, which seems kind of odd because we're like, oh yeah, of course we have mass, it's really obvious, but we've found actually no way of the anything causing this mass. So the proposed mechanism for causing that is something called a Higgs boson, which, so it's proposed that anything that has mass has one of these Higgs bosons. The Higgs boson has around it what's called a Higgs field, and it's the interaction of this field with another Higgs field that gives things mass. 
So it's basically a way, of, and then obviously if something mass, it's proposed that they exchange a graviton with another thing with mass, and that's how you get the gravitational energy. So this is a, it's even a step deeper than that, because this is actually what, how do things have mass in the first place? So this is to do with um, the, the, this proposed Higgs boson, which they, scientists are claiming they've discovered last year. I mean, I, I, don't, I haven't seen the exact paper, so I don't know how high their percentage certainty is, but it's certainly proposed, and anything they found seemed to be within the range proposed by the standard model. But again, this is something to go away and look at to extend your knowledge, because obviously this is the new area of particle physics.